Welcome along to the Thursday edition of the Celtic State of Mind Bulletin. I'm your host today, Colin Mott, and I'm delighted to be joined by the usual Thursday gang. We have Declan McConville and JP Mason. Guys, how are you both doing? Very well, Colin. Uh, another three points in the bag after the result last night. Uh, I feel as if I've been sitting in this chair podcasting yesterday and today, but we're here to talk about it once again. A couple other things on the agenda. Ryan Christie's potentially been offered a new deal by the club. Does it make sense for us to try and tie him down on a long-term deal? What does that add to his value at the club? We're also going to take a look at the progression of David Turnbull this year and ask how far can he actually go, as well as Greg Taylor. Is he now becoming one of the first names on the team sheet? Now, we're delighted to be joined by you all on Facebook, YouTube and Twitter. If you do have any points on last night's game or any of the topics we're going to be discussing, please let us know. Um, drop in the comments and we'll bring them up on the screen. We'll try and be as interactive as possible today. Um, but first of all, I just want to start by uh, touching on something that I was speaking about on yesterday's bulletin. And it was um, the story that came out about young Patrick Joyce. He's only 16 years old and he was writing 5,000 thank you cards to the NHS workers and care staff. Um, a lot of people then went on to the um, my tweet that I'd put out about it and sent a lot of nice messages to him so that was just a, a nice thing for everyone to have done so a big thank you to everyone who's done that um, and before we go on to talk about today's uh, topics JP you were telling me something just before we came on air that you wanted to tell everyone Oh it's not profound uh, I, I, <laughs> by any means uh, I just uh, my friend Michael told me last night about uh, well, not last night the night before about a documentary about St Pauli um, and uh, it's called The Fans Who Make Football. It's on, strangely, it's on Al Jazeera t- uh, TV, which I've never, ever watched Al Jazeera before. I didn't even realise I had access to it. Um, but, yeah, you learn something new every day. So I watched it. It's a really good documentary. If anyone's got an interest in San Pauli, which is obviously the strip behind me, I went for a different strip today. Uh, and there's a Celtic uh, uh, documentary, uh, part of the same series. It's on, uh, on the 23rd on Al Jazeera next week, which is about... Uh, Celtic, so um, just, just so people don't miss out on it, because like it, it's not been given that the fact that it's on Al Jazeera, it's not exactly been heavily uh, publicised. So um, hopefully it will be as good as the San Pauli one. I'm sure we're all looking forward to it. Um, so yeah, take a look out for that one next week on Celtic. But let's go back and take a look at last night's results: a one 0 victory over Aberdeen. David Turnbull with the only goal of the game. Declan, what was your thoughts on the game? Um, it was a bit of a hard watch for a lot of it, wasn't it? It was a hard watch, Colin. Um, first half, some nice bits of play in there, good bit of intensity in the play. And in the second half, you know, completely dropped off again. Not even just in the second half, the end of the first half, I thought we dropped off. And we were defending our penalty area for the, the latter stages of the game. It was a bit of a nail-biter. But um, in typical circumstances, if this was the, a title running, one nil at Aberdeen would all be delighted about and getting three points. Yep. I think just the circumstances of this season, you know, it's it's getting three points to just bridge a wee tiny gap between ourselves and the league leaders who are away far in front. So I think in the normal circumstances, one nil against Aberdeen at home would all be chuffed by another clean sheet as well, obviously. But um, in the circumstances, it's just another game ticked off and what's been another hellish season that we all want to end sooner rather than later. And that's five wins on the bounce now for Celtic. There's only nine games left of the season to go. JP, what was your thoughts on the performance last night? Uh, well, I mean, like like Declan was saying, you know, everybody would have been happy with a victory, but uh, the second half, what I saw of the second half, I only saw up to the 75th minute. I had to uh, cut short my break. Um, Lucky at- you. I know. I know. <laughs> so I then I was just checking the, the the score for the last fifteen minutes and just hoping not to see uh, a one appear next to Aberdeen because, well, from what I could see before I left the game, it was looking like they were starting to put pressure on, and uh, you know you could just see the headlines: Canberra scores or something like that. You know, just to sort of rub salt into the wound. But we hang on for the hung over the victory and. You know, we could have we could have hung on for the victory against Hibs uh, in January and not conceded that last minute equaliser. And there may be a different complexion on on what we're looking at right now if if that had happened. But that didn't happen. And then obviously we drew with Livingston as well and uh, twice, and then got beat off St Mirren. Um, so you know, the, last night whilst it was a welcome victory, you know, it, it is a little bit 
you know, it's hard to get too excited about it, isn't it? Really, when when you know, it isn't really going to do that much good in the in the, in the grand scheme of things. Um, yeah. It's a good point that you bring up, though, about um, conceding against Tibbs in the last couple of minutes because when you're watching that game last night, Aberdeen were throwing absolutely everything, including the kitchen sink at Celtic, especially right down at the last seconds of the game when Scott Bain's got to come out and gather the ball from the players' feet. So they were trying absolutely everything. Do you think that's a progression that Celtic have managed to do since the Hibs game that we are now able to hold on to these leads and although what we've seen this season, fans are never going to be comfortable with holding on for 1-0, but the team feel confident that they're going to keep that clean sheet. Declan, I'll throw that one out to you. I don't know, Colin. I think in that kind of first period of the bad run, going back to the 2-12, and 12, games like that and getting balls thrown into the box, we just couldn't defend set pieces. And we know that. We were absolutely atrocious. Even still, when a ball's getting fired into the box, I'm still worried when a ball goes in there. But last night showed a good bit of grit and determination and it maybe says something when your centre half and Chris Ayer gets man of the match I thought himself mm-hmm. and Welsh had a really good game you know and the two of them really defended their box well um, again if you go back to the semi-final against Aberdeen it was similar uh, Duffy had a good game that day one of his probably better games in a Celtic jersey because he was defending his penalty box so I think there maybe is a wee bit of progression there because in previous circumstances he would have probably crumbled and conceded the goal but uh, again if you flip that in its head, up front, again, very few chances in a game, not a lot of chances created. And when you are making chances, we want goals. And we're not doing that so often. I know we've obviously went to come on and get a decent result in, in St Murn, but in the grand scheme of things, we've not been burying teams this season. And that's been a bit of a worry. But last night, in terms of defending the, the penalty box, we were quite impressed by the, the centre-half performances anyway. And a bit of brave goalkeeping, especially at the end with Scott Bain, as you mentioned there. Yeah, and it's a good point to be made that we now seem to have a settled back four. You're looking at it, you've got John Joe Kenny in there alongside Iron Welsh and uh, Greg Taylor. And that seems to be the kind of first choice back four now. Um, we're taking a look at the stats, Greg Taylor started 18 games this season and we've only lost one of the games that he's played. Now you compare that to um, Diego Laxalt and it's nowhere near. He just seems to offer that bit of consistency now, there's a lot to be said that he doesn't offer a lot going forward, but he's now made six assists this season. He's only just behind Ryan Christie for the amount of assists that's been created. Um, yes, we know he's got a, a kind of level that he'll get to and he'll never get beyond that. But JP, do you think that back four is something that we should be looking to um, kind of... I'm trying to find the right, the right phrase here because it's not something we want to build on for next season because I don't think that... John Joe Kenny will be here next season and there's a good chance that Christopher Ayer's there but do you think there's some foundations that if someone was to go out injured next year these players are ready to make that step up and we shouldn't be so concerned about them um, getting the minutes for for the team well, I think um, well, definitely if you take Welsh as the first person to look at if you compare Welsh's performance again what I saw of it last night 75 minutes Compared to uh, Duffy's performance at the weekend against St Johnston, I know Paul was very vocal uh, on his uh, half thing. I think it was half. Was it half time or full time that he went in hard on uh, Duffy? Um, I can't remember if it was half time or full time. But he, he half time, yeah, half time. He kind of the gloves came off um, <laughs> for Duffy, um, which is a rarity from Paul. Really, doesn't he? Really. Uh, quite often go for folk like that but I mean he did it based on the football it wasn't based on anything else and and when you watched Welsh last night just his energy and his his readiness to you know receive the ball his flexibility in passing you know he doesn't he doesn't look flustered at any point and I, I just think that the, the contrast is absolutely stark with, with, with Shane Duffy so I can only say I'm really glad that we haven't actually shelled out you know, uh, a fee for Duffy and, and that he is only a loan player and, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll complete his loan at the end of this season and go back. Uh, Kenny, rumours are that he's on 15 grand a week. <laughs> so that, I mean, if, if Ryan Christie's on eight grand and John Joe Kenny's on 15 uh, as a loan player, then there's an immediate imbalance there, which you wonder if that affects everything everything within the dressing room, who knows. Uh, and and um, Ayer, I would love to think that Ayer would stay. I've been slagged on here for saying that Ayer's worth 25 million. I'll stand by that. I'll, I'll, I'll 
you know, I'll stand by that until, you know, uh, somebody tells me different in terms of when he actually signs for some another club. Um, but, you know, the, the, all, the, all the signs are that, you know, we're going to lose. Depending on what the market is like in the summer, you know, it may be that nobody has the money to come in and pay what we want for him and uh, he doesn't go. Um, that would be amazing um, as long as he's, you know, not going to throw the toys out of the pram over it. And Greg Taylor... Considering how far Greg Taylor was out the picture at the start of the season, to to have that sort of th- those stats that you just pointed out, to have those stats now as being a guy that's had that run in the team, um, you can only you know be impressed with that and say that he's he's earned his his, uh, his crust at Celtic so far. And whilst he's not here in Tierney, nobody ever will be. You know, he's he's definitely somebody that you I wouldn't want to see you know go anywhere in the summer um, just because he's not you know, fashionable or, you know, glitzy. Mm-hmm. No, definitely. And I, I think you can see even the development in Greg Taylor from the point of which we signed him from Kilmarnock to the, the player he is now. There's a lot more, um, there's a lot more confidence in his play. He's trying to take players on. He's getting into the right positions. Um, but just like with Jeremy Frimpong, his final ball's not quite there yet. Um, and it'll be interesting to see if he's able to develop that over the next few months. Uh, he's certainly got someone behind him that's pushing him to get the performances out of him and you can see that. Going back to Chris Iyer, the kind of image of last night's game <laughs> is at full time when Chris Iyer is celebrating the win and you know how much it meant to him. The, the arms are in the air, he's, he's really kind of buzzing at the fact that they've managed to hold on for the clean sheet. And Kenny67 comes in here on YouTube to say, the positives are Welsh and Iyer looking solid and Turnbull always looking, for, always looking creative. But for some inexplicable reason, he always gets hooked before the end. Mm. Um, now, I'm going to ask you guys as well what you're... I'm going to go for two positives and one recommendation. Um, a kind of general review system that probably a lot of people have in their own workplaces um, when they're getting their, their own reviews. On last night's game, and Declan, I'll come to you first. Two positives you can take from it and one thing you'd like to see is work on ahead of the game against Ross County at the weekend. I would say the two positives were the centre half pair again. I thought the two of them defended their box really well. Um, obviously, we wouldn't like to give up chances like we were giving up last night. I mean, it was a bit of play you'll probably remember, Colin, about 93 minutes. And Scott Bain's got a goal kick. It's a minute left in the clock. And he quickly takes a goal kick and gives it right back to Aberdeen and you're just inviting the pressure again. So, yeah. definitely the centre half pair is a positive. I thought David Turnbull was another positive again. His performance is Callum McGregor as well last night, you know, it has amazing runs, two really good amazing runs that he sent one's unfortunate out to pay off for Turnbull's second goal. So I would say Turnbull in the, the centre half pair as a recommendation it'd be the intensity of play just completely dropped off second half. Um that would be something that I think's lacked in our our play all season is our intensity. Just no you know, fitness levels just don't look there as much as they were at times last season and just try to keep it going and just really going at teams and burying games, you know. one nil, you know, it's three points, but we'd all like to just be a wee bit more comfortable. So that'd probably be my recommendation is to try and get a few more goals and create more chances. And so the player that you mentioned there that was actually getting a bit of stick on the post match review last night was Callum McGregor. Um and I was actually sticking up for him. I thought that he actually had a, a fairly decent game last night. Um, I think a lot of the play that he does goes unrecognised. Um, in your opinion, Declan, what, what, how did you rate his performance last night? Well, I'm quite a staunch Callum McGregor defender and I've been for years, so it's not really much bad I say about Callum McGregor. But I think he's just always that kind of, I call him the Celtic metronome in midfield. He's just constantly at it, constantly going. He's a ticking clock in there. And, uh, you know, there's been questions asked whether he could be Celtic captain or not. I think he can be. I think he's got that in his game. Um, and again, he's, he's a player that's been at the club a long time, but it's just constantly a high-level performer for me. He always gives you a six or seven, a ten every single game. So I thought he did OK last night, Colin. I thought he, you know, at times when we had a really good spell of play in the first half, he was the guy right in the middle of it. So I thought he did OK last night. And JP, that one to you as well. Callum McGregor, how you rated his performances, not just last night, but over the course of the season? I think you can tell he's been frustrated um, with how things have gone. And you can also tell that he, he actually cares about what's happening. You know, he's not, you know, a sort of, uh, you know, I just collect my paycheck every week and pretend that I, you know, like playing for Celtic. You know, he he does actually care. And, 
it will hurt him the fact that we are you know uh, suffering this you know weird downturn in fortune uh, this season. Uh, I think he's been a victim of the lack of consistency in terms of the team selection. You know, he's always played, but he's not always had the same players around about him and not had the same defence and everything else. So if you look at like his recovery or attempted recovery tackles, you know, why is Callum McGregor um, going up for a header in the box against uh, Rangers in that game when it comes off his shoulder? Do you know what I mean? That That's surely a centre-half position. Why is Callum McGregor running back and having to file for a penalty against Aberdeen at Patodre? Do you know what I mean? It's like things like that, 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 that all have haunted him. And, uh, and I thought he was, from what I saw of him last day, I thought he was, he was, he was decent. Um, it wasn't outstanding, but it was decent. I, just, I read an article, could be clickbait nonsense, I don't know, but saying that, uh, you know, the Leicester City thing, the door shut on that move. Um, and therefore, there's a potential that we could be offering him a new deal or something like that. Again, I would love to think that's the case. If if if, uh, if we could get him on a new deal, that would be amazing because he's certainly one of the players that you would not want to lose. Um, because obviously, you've got him. He's been there throughout this whole time, and you know Scott Brown has been as there throughout this whole time as well. But Scott Brown's you know coming to the end of his career, whereas Cal McGregor still got quite a lot left. To, to, to give on the park whereas Brown might be more behind the scenes so to have somebody like uh, Callum McGregor there for consistency for new players coming in would be you know the, the price you, you, you can't put a price in that really I don't think I'm just looking at some of the comments coming in on Callum McGregor David Bradley saying that Cal Mack is running on empty mm-hmm. um some other comments coming in on him as well David Kelly coming in to say McGregor has been very poor this season uh, you can see that he's suffering under Lennon and he's also run into the ga- the ground game after game. As you were saying, JP, he's played, what, every game this season so far? Um, and Philip DeMarco coming in to say that McGregor needs a rest. He'll probably play right through the summer now as well. But having beat, well, I mean, let's be honest, he's probably guaranteed to be in the Scotland squad barring any injury um, for the Euros. So you can see that flogged and horsed every game. Th- there's also been the fact that he's been given the captaincy. Um do you think he's a captain material? I mean, the chances are that Scott Brown may retire at the end of this season. His contract is up. Um, there's been discussions on whether he'll be given a one-year extension. I think it, it would be prudent to give him that extension, although I wouldn't want him to be playing a lot of games next season. You're hoping that he's there in a sort of mentoring and coaching capacity. So with him not being on the park, you are looking to who the next captain could be. A lot of people are saying that if Chris Iyer stays, they would give him the captaincy. Callum McGregor's been given it this season. Declan, what do you think? Has he kind of stood out to be that kind of commanding figure on the park? It's just kind of been a pass of the baton type thing. I think midfield calling, you know, with Callum playing in there so much with Scott and on his game so much. And, you know, he's all Celtic career so far. He's had Scott beside him, so he knows that they're only a Celtic captain. Um, I would love Chris Iyer to stay in the summer. Really would love him to stay. I would find a lot of money at him just now. Um, but, I'm a bit sceptical whether or not he will stay whereas I think something you touched on earlier Callum McGregor does care you can see he cares in performances and stuff I wouldn't like to lose him either I think there's more of a chance of Callum staying than it is Chris Iyer so I think he's probably the natural successor um, but between the two of them the two of them could be Celtic captain but I, I personally think Callum McGregor would be a decent Celtic captain and would be thoroughly deserving of it you know out of our whole squad he's been there the longest he's even been there longer than James Forrest I think he's been at the club since he was six or five or six, so he really knows what Celtic is all about. So, yeah, I think Cal McGregor would be a good Celtic captain. What's your thoughts on that, JP? Yeah, I agree. Um, I, I really do um, think that, you know, he's, he's well respected amongst the, 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 the players and, you know, people around the club as well. You know, people I've spoken to, I, I've got a lot of time for Cal McGregor um, that are, you know, in and around the club. So, I would certainly like to think that he would be given the, the, the contract offer, whether or not it's whether where, whether or not that's where he sees his career going. I don't know. Um, it all depends on how the changes are made in the summer and if if they're for the for the positive or, or not. But just on Scott Brown, I think um, it would be absolute madness to not offer Scott Brown a, a one year uh, deal. I agree with the the sort of added. Uh, um, 
incentive that he doesn't play every week. Um, not no disrespect to him, but you know it's it's not it's not really uh, it's not really Scott Brown's time anymore. It's it's more about what's what's coming through. But I think for any any overhaul that's happening in the summer to have some sort of consistency, Scott Brown's been there, done that, and bought the t-shirt. So I, I, I think it would be, as much as people would be like, no, get Brown, get rid of him in the summer or whatever that, you've got to think about the bigger picture and his importance and, you know, talking people through what the importance of the club is and everything else, you know, I, I, that that in itself is invaluable. And, and for that reason, I'd want him to stay. Yeah, it's hard to disagree with any of that. I think McGregor has been one of Celtic's most consistent performers over the course of the last four or five years. Um, yeah. And do you know what? I don't think anyone has really had a standout season this year. I guess you could say David Turnbull sort of came out of the the kind of the shadows to show his ability. But I think if anyone was watching David Turnbull before he came to Celtic, you could see that he already had that ability in him. It was just whether he could make the step up to play for Celtic. Um, So that shouldn't really come as a surprise to a lot of people. And Chris Ayer's probably been one of the most consistent ones. But around that, there's very few players that you'd say are kind of in there and in the running for a sort of player of the year award Um, so one to keep an eye on and before we get to JP's two positives and one negative from well not negative one development from last night there's a bit of a a commotion going on in the chat Um, so I'm just going to bring it up on the screen feed the bear I hope Paul John as well Paul John who? oh oh, right he means Paul John Dykes like the guy that normally hosts the show um (laughs) I mean, you've you've got you've got the pound shop Jurgen Klopp here. Surely that's enough for some people. But and by uh, the way, Colin, somebody said earlier, Diego likes his wee brother. <laughs> <laughs> you, get so, um, you know, you get the cornrows. Uh, <laughs> but no, just just to let everyone know, Paul is doing fine. Um, he's just working on a couple of other things for the channel that you'll be able to see in the next couple of days or so. Uh, but. We've got you the pound shop, Jurgen Klopp and Diego Laxalt's wee brother. I'm sure that's a suitable replacement <laughs> for the Thursday squad. Um, but JP, getting back to two positives and one improvement um, on the performance from last night, or for what you've seen anyway. Um, well, my positive would definitely be Welsh uh, coming back because I'm so glad he's back and not injured. Because uh, when he went over on his ankle, I, I really feared the worst, as, as did we all. So it was great to see him back so soon. Um, and and you know slotting back in and and you know looking like he hadn't been out of the team really. Um, <laughs> um, so and I, I I called myself I gave myself that name as soon as I come and spoke to him. That was just in my head as well when someone said that. But uh, aye, so Welsh coming back and uh, I thought you know I've had a few question marks over sorrow. And I thought certainly in the first half, Sorrow was all over the place, and I liked a lot of his recovery tackles. Um, and I saw a stat. I don't know, maybe you guys shared it, maybe afterwards. But it was his pass rate ninety three percent or something in the first half? Yeah, Sorrow's. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Someone, yeah. someone highlighted that to us on the stream last night. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's that's <laughs> impressive. And uh, yeah, I'd, I'd certainly, if I had any, you know, niggling doubts about him, it, you know, he certainly. Last night it was good to see him in that environment, you know, sort of taking the ball by the horns. And I like the fact that there's a bit of camaraderie between him and Scott Brown. Obviously, when you see them uh, uh, sort of exchanging as they come off for substitutes, there's a wee sort of smile, and and uh, they're obviously, you know, I'm sure Soros learning all the time off Scott Brown, which you know can only be a good thing. Um, the development, I'd say, very worried about Albi and Ayeti. Um, I just, I, you know, again, there'll be people who'll be like, oh, it's Lennon, you know, uh, you know, Lennon's coaching methods and blah, blah, blah. It's not Lennon's coaching methods. This is about the football player. The football player who we signed from West Ham who hadn't kicked the ball for West Ham. Why had they not kicked the ball for West Ham? We didn't sign a proven goal scorer in Albion Ayeti from West Ham. We signed the guy that hadn't kicked the ball for them. You know what I mean? So question marks over why that was the case and question marks over why he's been not really at it in terms of his Celtic career so far. Um, you know, fitness, etc. I don't know. But I just, I just, it just looks a bit kind of awkward up there. And I, 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 didn't, I didn't really see anything between him and Edward that filled me with excitement and certainly in that first 45 anyway. I think there's something to be said about the fact that we tried to sign him on loan in the summer. 
Uh, the original deal was supposed to be a loan deal with the, mm. the option to buy him at the end of the year. Um, and then that sort of just sort of get like pushed along and it was just a case of, right, okay, we'll just sign him permanently up front. Mm. Um, if, he, if he had signed him on loan this season, I don't think it would be sitting here now going, yeah, we're going to go spend £5 million on this player. No. Um, no. no. And now you're in the situation where you've already spent that money and you've got to try and get the best out of that player now because you're not going to get that return back this summer. So he's going to have another full pre-season under his belt. It took him long enough to come in last pre-season so you could almost make that excuse and he's been injured as well. But as you said last night, it just looked as if there wasn't a partnership going with Eddie up front. Um, I don't think he had a single shot on target. He mm. did see glimpses of what he could do to an extent. Um, he was able to hold the ball up really well. It stuck to his feet. But I feel as if he's one of these confidence players that mm. he needs sort of two or three goals in a row and then you'll get the best out of him. But at the minute, I just don't see him getting the service in the way that we're playing. We're not creating a lot of chances. It probably doesn't suit him to be in and about the squad. I would maybe see someone like Lee Griffiths or um, Patrick Clamalla coming back in, to be honest. What's your thoughts on that? I'll throw that out to whoever wants to answer that. Well, well I was going to say, Colin, I think I touched on it last week. If you look at Albie's game time before he, his goal at Kelly, I think he played half the game time between his goal against Hibs at the end of September and the goal against Kelly. So it was a player that game time-wise wasn't given a lot of games in the park, so it had needed that run of games. But in terms of his play, you know, he's a... He's a poacher, he's a penalty box player. I know we tied him out as a, a lone striker. I don't think he's a lone striker, he needs a partner. Service-wise, you know, he's going to be a guy, it reminds me at times like Gary Hooper, he's going to be in the box and he's going to be sniffing about, but you need to get the service in there. And last night, service's feet wasn't great, so that is something as a collective, as a team you need to work on. Um, because if he's just going to be his kind of usual sell and strut about and wait for the ball at his feet, you're not going to get anything done. So it's going to need to be a bit of a balance between the ball getting on his feet and moving about a wee bit quicker. But again, to touch on Neil Lennon's comments, he said that he was only coming up to conditioning level there at the beginning of February, which really worries me. Why Why is that taking so long for a player to be signed in August to come up to conditioning level? Yeah, it's quite a worrying thought. And as you said, he hadn't had a lot of game time, and I think there was—I think it was Lee Griffiths that said earlier in the season: "There's only so much training you can do in the training ground. You have to get that minutes on the park to get it into your legs and get yourself up to match fitness." A lot of people saying um, in the comments that he looks overweight. I, I don't know. I think he might be one of those players. I think Chris Commons was always mentioned about it, and Big John Hartson was famous for it. Um, that he was kind of just the way that he was built and the stockiness. But there's been a lot of I'd say a lot. There's been glimpses of what Albin Ayeti can do this season. If you take a look at the game away to Lille, when he was his link-up play in the first half with Mohamed El Anoussi, um, someone that he's actually worked with before at Bal, um, and there's been glimpses at home to Hibs, the two goals that he scored before he got injured. There, I think there's still a player in there. What would your thoughts be, JP? Is someone you'd like to give another pre-season to and see how he gets on at the start of next year? Oh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not by any means writing him off. Um, it'd be very premature to do that. I think, given that he's not even completed the season, and you know how many games has he actually played. But um, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, you know, you're talking about his link up like play with El Yunusi. You look at um, Edwards' link up play with Turnbull. You know, the, the two of them are definitely on the same wavelength. You know, they they know what each other can do. And what each other's capable of, like the we the we one two he played with, uh, the Edward played with Turnbull on the edge of the box when Turnbull dragged his shot wide. I think it was maybe ten fifteen minutes after his goal. Uh, that was that was nice. And there's definitely an like you can tell when they celebrated together the goal that there was like you know they were both smiling and both like oh well you know you know this is this is kind of uh, coming off for us in games as well as training. So I think a Yeti. Um, whether he's maybe sort of in the shadow of Edward a bit, you know, given the fact that Edward is, you know, completely head and shoulders the best player uh, at the club, you know, um, and will command the biggest fee. Um, maybe a Yeti's kind of thinking, oh, 
I'm 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 not as good as this guy, or I'm I'm going to try and outdo this guy. I don't know. I mean, I'm speculating, but um, I just find him a little bit awkward up front at the moment. And and yeah, you have like you said, he has done things in games and scored goals that have been impressive. And you know, uh, his most recent one uh, being a case in point where he held off the defender and then buried it. You know, so he's it's not like he can't do it. It's just a case of finding that consistency and. Um, and yeah, probably does need a goal um, for for confidence, um, and uh, we'll see how that goes. There's a couple of points coming through in the comments, and I wonder what your thoughts are on this. Uh, Robert Highland coming in saying Alby needs wingers, and mm. there's a point just further up here from uh, Mamansis sixty seven. The sooner James Forrest comes back, the better. I think a lot can be said about the service that the forwards have had this season. I mean, it came as a surprise to me that Odson Edward had scored 20 goals this year um, because you, you don't tend to see a lot of chances being created from the wide areas. It always seems to be coming through the middle. The introduction of David Turnbull really helped that. Um, he manages to find spaces that some players would never ever see on the park. The ball's over the top. Um, between him and Tom Rogic, the, the passing is, is really impressive. But I think a lot of Celtic's play over the last few years, especially if you look at it, has came from the wide areas. And losing someone like James Forrest this year, you're taking not only 15 goals out the side, but you're taking 15 to 20 assists out as well. And you just wonder, as Declan says, he's a bit of a penalty box striker. When we go back to having those wingers, do you think that you'll see more of what a Yeti can do? I think so. As to anyone um, who wants to answer. <laughs> I think, as you touched on, Colin, you know, at the start of the season... There was always a worry that they were short to me in the, the two areas, and we've seen that. You know, we've got Mikey Johnson and Moyle and Usain on the left hand side as wingers, and an injured James Forrest on the right hand side, and kind of shoehorn Ryan Christie in there. We then try to play that kind of system with Christie on the right hand side and Ellen Usain on the other side, didn't really work. And I, inevitably, we went to that diamond in midfield come December time because it just looked as if we were running out of formations. The 3 5 2 wasn't working, we tried the full backs in there, didn't work out for us. So I think shape-wise, maybe the the, the four four two diamond maybe just doesn't work for Albert yet as well, but a lot more narrow. And um, that was something we were all kind of happy about because of the way we were conceding goals when we tried it out. It worked because we were able to tighten up the midfield. Um, I think wide players would probably add a wee bit more to his game. Uh, he certainly needs a partner up front. Whether a kind of four four two straight would be a bit better for Albert yet. I don't know. It's just speculation because I've not seen him really play with it. Yeah, JP, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think um, James Forrest, as much as, oh God, in my section at Celtic Park, there's people around about me that have thrown so much abuse at James Forrest over the over the, over the the piece since I've sat there. I've had that seat since 2012, I think it was. And um, yeah, he's had so much abuse. But at the same time, it's like, yeah, there's nothing better when James Forrest scores a goal. I've Especially, I have an important goal and turning around and just making eye contact with these people and being like, you know, because it's, <laughs> you know, uh, like you know, some people are just they've really got it in for them, and uh, yeah. we've missed them. You can't. You you read out the stats, the, the assists, the goals. You know, um, he's 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 got those numbers for a reason. Do you know what I mean? They're not made up numbers. They're re- real goals, real assists, and and have come in big games. It's not as if you can just say, "Oh, James Forrest only scores when we're four 0 up against you know you know St Johnson at home." Oh, oh to be four 0 up against St Johnson at home, by the way. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, it's not one of those. He's not like a you know a sort of uh, I'll just turn it on when the game's done. You know, he scored big goals. There's no denying that, um, and and you know, and the assists as well. The assists are there for the strikers, and currently we've not got somebody doing that. Yeah, and um, I think you say that there's probably been a lot of Celtic fans that are now looking at this this season and going, "Jesus, maybe I was given the one that was given James Forrest a stick, but now you're you're desperate to get someone like that back into the team. He gives you that energy that we seem to be lacking, Declan. You touched on it earlier." Some of the build-up play is really, really slow. Um, But you know if you get the ball out to James Forrest, he's going to have a go and he's going to run at the wingers. Um, And it's... Yeah, you'd need to change the formation up to get someone like him back in. You'd also need to change the formation up to get someone out on the left-hand side as well. And we don't really have that option at the minute. 
for me, I wouldn't be playing Elanusi out wide left. I just don't think he's got the pace to do it. A lot of people say, well, he can cut inside and he can he can stick one in net. The last player that kind of reminded me of that was Scott Sinclair. Um, and Scott Sinclair's came up in the comments. If you'd a Scott Sinclair from first year under Brendan Rogers in that team, it would be another level above. He was one that was eventually found out, I think. He, he just knew he was going to cut inside and he was going to try and curl one. With James Forrest, at least he tries to hit the byline before he's putting the ball across. He can cut inside as well. You've seen that. I think that the time that we beat Rangers 5-0 at Celtic Park when we kind of won the league that day, his performance was outstanding and it's yeah. kind of the level that you can see from him. Um, but we're going to go back to talking about the squad later on. We're going to take a look at some of the players that may be moving on. We'll take a look at the 11 that started last night and we'll ask the guys um, how many of them you think will still be here next season. We're also still live at the minute on Facebook, on YouTube and on Twitter. So if you do have any comments, um, come and let them in, uh, come and let us know what you think. David Bradley coming in again. Sinclair should have been kept, just going on to the point that I was making earlier on. Uh, Phil17, um, HG Smith, I'm just making sure I got that one right. Guaranteed that Mikey Johnson won't play again under Lennon. I'm seeing quite a few of these comments about players that won't play under Lennon. Some people saying Lee Griffiths, some people saying Mikey Johnson. Is it just a case for Mikey Johnson that he doesn't suit the formation that we're playing at the minute? I'll throw that one to Declan. I think so. We touched on earlier, you know, that this kind of 4 2 diamond seems to be working just now. Um, it's getting results. As you said earlier at the start of the show, Colin, you know, five wins and a bounce. We're not going to change the formation anytime soon. So where Mikey Johnson would come in there, I don't know just now. And I think Mikey, you know, you would say he's probably one of the players that's got a wee bit more game time under Neil Lennon and scored obviously that big away goal against Sarajevo uh, last year in Champions League qualifying. You know, he's been unlucky with injuries. I think that if you were maybe playing a different formation, he would have a wee bit more of a chance in the team. I think Neil Lennon quite fancied him as a player, but um, I just think, as you say, Colin, formation-wise, it just doesn't suit him, Moyle and Hussain. Even if James Forrest goes back, I don't know where he would play just now, because I think he would stick with this formation. Connor Kelly coming in here, I think it's where we fly dig. Why is the views down when PGD isn't here? Um, Well, you know what to do. Share the podcast with everyone on Twitter, on Facebook. Tell them to come on and uh, get involved. If you're watching on YouTube at the minute, please like and subscribe to the channel. We just passed 9,500 subscribers yesterday. Um, let's see how quickly we can get to 10,000. An incredible jump from the 500 that we had at the start of July when we started doing these broadcasts every day. Um, in the shape of the space of seven months, it's been incredible. So big thank you to everyone who is watching us. We're going to move on and talk about the second talking point that you can see on your screen and it is the new contract potentially on the table for Ryan Christie. Ryan Christie is one of 10 players that is actually going to be out of contract next summer. Um, not this summer coming up, but next summer. So he's got roughly about 17, 16, 17 months left on his deal. Um, this season, he has four goals and nine assists in the SPL and two goals in the Scottish Cup. Guys, I'll throw it to you first. Uh, someone actually had a go at me for calling you JP. They wanted me to call you PK for Poundland Klopp. Nice. Uh, so PK, um, what would your thoughts be on um, Ryan Christie getting a new deal? Uh, I'm not entirely against it. However, uh, I would only want him to get a new deal if that is what he actually wanted because... We saw uh, Olivier and Cham sign a new deal and hold the jersey with a big smiling face and everything else. And it's just like, you don't want to be there. You're, you're, you've, you've signed that deal. You don't want to be here. You want to be anywhere but here. And that's been proven. Uh, so why he signed that deal at that point, clearly to get more money and obviously maybe to, uh, to make sure that we got a, a transfer fee when a club came in for him. Um, why we didn't take that sort of crazy money that was offered that is, you know, how much did, was it Porto were linked with them for 17? <laughs> yeah, something around that. And I think, was it last, probably about this time last year, just before the transfer window closed, West Ham were linked with a move for about yeah. 12, 13 million. Yeah. So, I, yeah. I'm just not, a, for somebody is really, really, you know, not wanting to be at the, at the, in, in Glasgow or even at uh, Celtic or in Glasgow, you know, then it's time for them to to go, and uh, the, the Ryan Christie thing. 
I've heard a lot of things about Ryan Christie, whether or not he wants to test his, uh, you know, um, metal elsewhere in a in a in a bigger or so called better league. Um, and you know, if if that is the case, then fine. I've got no issue with somebody wanting to go and play somewhere else. You know, if if you know if they, it's, it's no, not everyone is like us who would just stay at Celtic for an entire career. Um, you know, I'm saying that. Who knows if I was a, a football player, I might I might think differently. <laughs> but um, I, I certainly couldn't see myself leaving Celtic to go to another club. But, uh, but then that's that's just me and uh, whatever. But um, but Ryan Christie, yeah, I I think he I think he's a really good player. Uh, I, I I think he's he's you know folks lag him for the, the the shots at goal and the skyward shots, but then. You only have to ah yeah. <laughs> you only have to look at the high scores, you know, like the recent one in off the post against uh, was it St. Mirren? Oh, I got that wrong. St. John's. Yeah, St. Mirren. Yeah, St. Mirren. St. Mirren. St. Mirren. Yeah. Um, so that, I mean that that type of finish, he's got that in his locker. Um, he's also got you know hitting Rose Ed in his locker as well. But um, that's frustrating in a game where you're looking for something and you don't get it from anybody else. And if the few chances that come our way are are spurned and he's one of the ones that's done that, then that that's what sticks in your memory. Um, but his energy, you know, look at his, the two goals he set up for Edward the other day. You know, that wee dummy was great. Um, put the ball in for him as well. So he, he's a Scotland international as well. I, I hate any Scotland internationals leaving Celtic because it's just... I, like, I love the fact that there's Scottish players playing for Celtic and when you see the Scotland team announced and it's just like Celtic, 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 Celtic next to all the names, that 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 I'll get a buzz off that. And some people probably don't care, but I, I, I like that and I like it being a Scottish contingent and uh and from that from that perspective alone I wouldn't want him to, to go. But like I said, if it, if it is something that he wants to, to do and go elsewhere, then he, he goes with my wishes, best wishes. Yeah, and you look at it, so again, come the summary of 12 months left on his deal, that's the first chance that um, he would have to, to move on if that was what he wanted to do. With 12 months left on his deal, what would you think his value would be sitting at? Oh, Frimpong, 11.5 million. Ryan Christie, established international, uh, you know, however many appearances for Celtic and, you know, all the rest of it, not so much, not so many Champions League appearances. Because if you think about it, he's not really played in the Champions League, has he? So you can't really throw that. At him. I would say somewhere between ten and fifteen million. I think would be a, a, a rough, a rough guide. Uh, I, I think we'd do well to get ten million because of the fact he's only got twelve months left on his deal. Again, mm-hmm. if he signs a new contract and he goes to move on in the summer. Um, you've got that idea that he's maybe got two, three years left on his deal. Everyone knows having that extra time on your deal adds to the value of the player. Um, you see a lot of these players that go for like next to nothing because a contract's running out. Um, when you've only got 12 months left, it can be a bit difficult. Declan, what would you reckon you could get for someone like Ryan Christie in the current market with 12 months left on his deal? I think as you touched on, Colin, you know, it's a deflated market just now. Um, if the player's only got 12 months left in his contract... I think at that rate, you'd be looking probably between five and eight million at that rate with 12 months left of his contract. But I certainly think he's worth 10 plus. Um, as, as JP touched on it, you know, he's an established international player. Last season, he's arguably one of the better, the best players in the teams probably. And they're running for player of the year a long way. Odson Edward, a um, lot of goals and a lot of assists last season. But I think a few things to touch on with, with Ryan Christie is one of my biggest frustrations was when Dedrick Boyata left Celtic for free to her for Berlin and there was a established Belgium uh, internationalist that was leaving Celtic for zero to go to, to Germany that's a frustration nobody should believe in the club that is an established international and a good player first team player for nothing um, I, I would only be offering Ryan Christie a new contract if he wanted to stay at the club or whether it was a kind of gentleman's agreement to make sure that the club get more money for him to go um, reading in between the lines of his father's comments Charlie Christie it looks as if he's probably been drawn by the riches of English football and, and further afield. You know, his mate Stuart Armstrong's down at Southampton, earning fortunes compared to what he's probably on at Celtic. So, wants to have a wee crack at that. As well as that, his career so far, you know, Inverness to Celtic and then the loan deal up at Aberdeen. He's not really had that, what you would call the glamour move that he's, his mate and Stuart Armstrong's had. So, maybe he wants to try that out. You know, it's a short career in football. 
and he probably wants to earn himself a few quid. So, you know, Chris to be a new contract, I would only give him it if he wants to stay and he wants to commit himself to the club. But if not, it's about getting the club money. Um, because I think with 12 months left in the contract, it would either just be ran down or you would get a really poor transfer fee to see from that doesn't really reflect what he's worth, in my opinion. And taking a look at that, and you mentioned Stuart Armstrong, what the, what kind of teams do you think would be interested in Ryan Christie? I've always said, I think he'll do well to get someone in the kind of lower half of the Premiership um, fighting for, towards relegation, the kind of teams that sit around about there. Or maybe someone in the Championship that's looking to make that step up to the Premier League, someone like a Norwich or a Brentford or someone like that. I think that would be a good move for him. Where do you mm. think he could um, find himself when he leaves Celtic? I don't think he's as good a player as Stuart Armstrong uh, I think Stuart's a better player than him so I think certainly bottom half of the English Premier League is our teams maybe coming up from the, the league but again no, I, I read a report that it was linked by a, a deal to Tennis in the south of France I mean you know I think for a lot of you know players coming towards that age a wee move to France to play the rest of their football is quite attractive so it might not be the English Premier League but I certainly think if it was to go to the Prem it would probably be kind of bottom half table or a team coming up from promotion On that note uh, uh, Yeah I read an article well yeah I read that about him going to Nice as well um, I lived in Nice for six months when I was a student and it's uh, an un- unbelievable place to, to stay you know right in the, the, the south of France Monaco's along the road Cannes down the road Every, everywhere is kind of reachable by train like half an hour and uh, it's just a, it's a great place to play uh, to, to live uh, but the French, I read that article about the French league, and it's kind of there's no money in French football because they were talking about yeah, they're struggling um, right now. You know, mm. if there was a French club that came in for Edward, they wouldn't have the sort of money that we would be looking for for Edward. So that would be a door closed on on Eddie going back to France. So therefore, if we were looking to get some sort of fee for for Ryan Christie in the summer from Nice, I don't know if Nice would have that money because they're. The, the TV deal collapsed, I think it was, and, and therefore mm-hmm. yep. French football's not in the same place as it was, you know, six months ago or a year ago. So, you know, who, who knows? Like, uh, you know, like Declan said, it is a deflated market. I've got absolutely no idea what's going to happen in terms of transfer activity, you know, anywhere really in the summer. It's, uh, it's just all really unknown. Uh, and, you know, when you see our half year results, if our half year results are bad, then other clubs' half year results are going to be really bad as well. Um, let's face facts. So, where would you think he would end up then? If if Nice is off the table and it well, was a move down south, yeah, I I, I think I think uh, you know I, I certainly don't think a top half Premiership club are going to come in from. Um, there was I read. Uh, an article saying Arsenal at one point there's no no way um, are Arsenal a top chance. half Premiership club at the minute uh, yeah, that's another question <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah I, I, I think you know I think maybe yeah maybe like a top end Championship club or something like that maybe, maybe he's got to do there's no way Ryan Christie's going to go straight to the club that he wants to go to um, he's got to do a, a sort of maybe Lesser, lesser level or lesser rung move that what Stuart Armstrong's done going to Southampton. Well, Stuart Armstrong's obviously playing well for Southampton and might get a move to a bigger club in England or or abroad. Um, and I think that you know Ryan Christie would need to do that as well if he wanted to get you know he's got to look at it like a snooker move. Obviously, he's got to look for the next move after the one that he does initially. <laughs> Just seen some of the comments coming in for um, some of the suggestions. I think somewhere in the region of five to eight million, I think that Declan said is probably what you're looking at at the value for Ryan Christie, especially with 12 months left on his deal. If he was to have another couple of years, that probably adds another couple of million on somewhere along the line. Um, but yeah, it's a deflated market. You don't really know what's going to happen. You've seen the struggles that Marseille had um, trying to get the deal done for Olivier and Cham. It had to be a loan deal first. Uh, you've seen Moussa Dembele move from Lyon to Atletico Madrid. Although there's a, a guarantee kind of purchase price at the end of that, um, it was still another loan deal. Even um, probably a, a sin to bring this up on the podcast, but you take a look at Ben Davies' deal from Preston to Liverpool. That's £500,000 up front. It's not as if there's a lot of money being spent in the transfer market. So mm. um, the kind of money that people think certain players may be worth, that money might not be there to spend. 
So you, you have to kind of look at the, it's a buyer's market. It's only, the player's only going to be worth what the, play, what the club can afford to spend. Um, and you may see some players that we think would move on this summer, maybe like a Christopher Ayer, as you were saying earlier, JP, if the price isn't there for that player, and the player isn't necessarily making moves to um, leave the club, it could be someone that you see still at the club next season. Ryan Christie, though, I, I think Ryan Christie tried to make his move last summer, um, and with only 12 months left on his deal, if you're looking at it as a business sense, anyone with 12 months left on their deal that isn't going to sign a new contract should be making the move on in the summer. Mm-hmm. Just, Declan, you're nodding away there. Yeah, I think it was probably one of the contingent that wanted to go last summer. Um, but we've heard the club, Neil Banker and Peter Lowell, say that probably wasn't the best decision that they made in terms of keeping players that didn't want to be there. I think he was one of those guys. So, you know, we, we don't want people like that in the dressing room that don't want to be at the club. And I think that's been one of our biggest downfalls this season. It has gone back to way back to last summer, is keeping players that don't want to be there. But is there worry? As you say there, Colin, you know, 12 months in the contract come this summer, you're not going to get the money you expect from them at that because either the club will just run it down and say we can get you in January for a cut price deal and bring you in, just wait where you are. Um, so it'd be a case of, I think, tying Ryan Christie down for one, two years to then try and get a, a few quid for him in the agreement that will let him go. And then ask the question, who would come in to replace him? Now, Ryan Christie's played in a number of positions for Celtic. Uh, you see it that he's played on the right hand side, the left hand side. He's played at the top of the diamond. He sat in a sort of um, centre midfield role, so he has been very versatile for Celtic when we've needed him to be. Um, could it be that David Turnbull is already there as the replacement, and you've already got guys like Tom Rogic, who again was someone that we thought was going to be leaving the club in the summer, has stayed on. I'm not sure how long's left on his deal. Actually, I'd need to to look that one up. But if you were looking to bring in a replacement for Ryan Christie across kind of, uh, well, I'd say across Scotland and the UK at the minute because I think it's going to be more difficult to bring guys in from Europe. I don't think you're going to have the money to bring guys in from Europe as well that are developed to that level. Within Scottish football, within UK football, who would be the replacement you think is out there for Ryan Christie? I'll throw that open to both of you. Well, we're not just signed, we've just signed this boy from Sheffield Wednesday. He's a midfielder. Uh, I don't know anything about him at all. Um, I just know that um, <laughs> my friend Ian Shaw will be pretty uh, delighted that there's going to be a Shaw that he could get, actually get in the back of mm. uh, If a uh, <laughs> 40-year-old guy <laughs> would consider getting a 20-something-year-old boy's uh, name in the back of his top, I know that was discussed yesterday about whether or not... Um, Laura would get Turnbull in the back of her top. Um, yeah. uh, maybe not the maybe not the coolest thing to do, but um, I, I I don't know anything about um, this boy Shaw that's coming in uh, midfielder, but can also play centre half. Uh, please just pick one. <laughs> don't don't try and do, <laughs> you know, uh, the whole beat on thing is is is, is soured that uh, thing. I just I just would want a player to play in the position that we sign them for. So. If Shaw comes in, well, when Shaw comes in, he's another midfielder into the mix. So uh, that allows us to move people around in the midfield. So if Christie did go, it might not be a complete disaster if he if he if he went. Um, as for other players that uh, are about, I have absolutely no idea. I know James McCarthy's been mentioned a lot. Um, and I, I don't want us. Begging, shaking his head. They're not no, a fan no, of that I, one. It's a, constant, it's a constant Celtic link every year. James McCarthy. Just don't, don't fancy him at all. No, I think that, that ship sailed a long time ago. Probably when he was at Hamilton. You know, like we, mm. we got him at that point, then then maybe we could have got a couple of years out of him before he went down to England, rather than you know the other way around. Um, so I, I, yeah, I don't. I've got no idea about a, a potential replacement for Ryan Christie. And my my, uh, my knowledge of current football uh, out with Celtic is not that great. <laughs> so, um, okay, yeah. Kevin Graham coming in here, uh, regular contributor mm. to Celtic State of Mind. Is Colin trying to get a Lewis Ferguson discussion going? Um, no, I'll knock that one in the head. I don't think Lewis Ferguson's going to be anywhere near good enough to play for Celtic. I watched them last night. Um, and the only thing I can say about Lewis Ferguson is every time he plays Celtic, he's guaranteed to get a yellow card. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think he's he's got that ability to make the step up. Um, and I think Aberdeen's probably as good as his level. 
the player that plays alongside him, Robbie McCrory, is probably a better talent than Lewis Ferguson. Uh, and that's saying something. For me, if you're looking in the Scottish League for someone, my suggestion that I would throw out there would be Alan Campbell from Motherwell. Ah, thoughts on that one? I was just thinking that. I, and the only reason uh, I was thinking that was because my mate, who's a massive Motherwell fan, was going on about Campbell. Uh, when we were initially signing the Turnbull, he was going on about Campbell. Uh, that's that's very strange you should say that. So, Declan, thoughts on Alan Campbell? Um, he scored a good goal at Celtic Park and obviously Motherwell's 2-1 defeat decent player he gets into the to get into the Scotland under 21s Callan Campbell quite regularly yep. yeah yep. Um, so you know come in there obviously David Turnbull's there but looking at the comments I think we forget ourselves I think Ryan Christie if he was to leave it depends on shape where you'd be looking to mm-hmm. place him in you know because obviously we've seen him as a number 10 we've seen him on the right hand side we've seen him saying on a diamond we've seen him play up front We've got two young players, and Ewan Henderson and Scott Robertson, that could also do a job in midfield as if it's going to be that central role. Um, so, we, you know, it might not even be looking in the market. It might be just looking at what we've got under our feet and seeing if those two guys could go in there and do a job. I don't think Ewan Henderson's been given a big enough chance yet at Celtic. I really like him. I think he's got something about his game. You saw that in the, the, the time he got against Lille. Um, but he was versatile again. He came in and ended up playing kind of in the wing. And I thought when Neil brought him into the side the game at Tynecast, I thought it was excellent that night. He plays a really, really nice through ball. So I may just be looking more internally. Um, but my pal Patrick is absolutely obsessed with us signing Lewis Ferguson. I've told him it's not going to happen. <laughs> he really, really wants us to. But I agree with you, Colin. Last night, I thought it was poor. Um, and I've had a choice between Celtic signing Campbell or Ferguson. For badness, I would rather sign Alan Campbell because I don't. <laughs> and any Ferguson's in a Celtic jersey, preferably. <laughs> Just on that point about um, you know looking within, I think it, it, what needs to happen um, in order for a player to get that opportunity to get in to the side is you look at what has happened with Welsh. You know, like at the, the centre halves that we've had have just been atrocious, really. I mean, you know, uh, obviously not Ayer, but but Duffy has been poor, um, Beaton has not filled me with any confidence when he's played at centre half. So therefore you're left with no option but to look within and then look what happens. You play a guy and he actually starts to get assured and look good. So it would need a midfielder to get injured or a couple of midfielders to get injured before we would actually look to give somebody like Henderson a run in the team and then see what they can do over a period rather than just having like this sort of one cameo and then disappear Um uh, for for months, uh, so yeah, I think it's it, like you said, it's it's about opportunity and and chance, uh, and whether or not we can uh, give these guys that chance. Um, so if a player goes and it opens up a a, a gap, then yeah. you know perhaps that could allow Henderson or Robertson to to exploit it. And it's a good point you make on Scott Robertson. Um, Twenty two appearances he's made in his two loan spells. I didn't ever understand the reason that we brought him back for the two games against uh, Hibs and against Livingston. That made absolutely no sense to me. Um, but he's now back on loan. I believe he was playing last night for Doncaster um, and was, I think, a lot of the Doncaster fans were saying he was probably the man of the match before he was taken off. Um, and in the appearances that I've seen him play for Celtic, he definitely looks as if he's got something about him. Um but shouldn't these players be? Shouldn't we be trying to get these players out to teams in Scotland to get them out on loan? It's a point I've made a few times, and I'd be interested in your thoughts on that one. You take a look at um, Rangers and the players that they've loaned out. Robbie McCrory was out on loan. Jamie Murphy was out on loan. Um, Glenn Middleton out on loan, and they're getting experience in the Scottish league, so that if they ever have to bring them back to to play for Rangers, they, they know how the game plays. A lot of the players we're sending out on loan, you've got Jack Hendry in Belgium, you've got Bio in France, Robertson's down in, in England, um, O'Connor's down in England. They're not experiencing what it's like to play in Scottish football. If they knows that it's different to any other kind of football around the world, it's a bit more physical um, and getting up to the speed of it can be, be difficult. You see it for any new signing that comes in. Shouldn't these guys be getting experience at that, that level, playing them f- for a... St Mirren for a Hamilton for a Motherwell for a Ross County I know um, the boy Henderson went out on loan to Ross County last season and barely got a sniff of it but it's that kind of level you want them to be playing at because when they come into Celtic that is the level they have to face Yeah, yeah I agree I, I think I think uh, 
there's certainly an argument for that, and it's not as if you know maybe it's the players' preference to go and play in a different league. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm, uh, there was talk of Saint Mirren in for Bio at one yeah. point. Yep, uh, and maybe he just sort of went. Nah, don't fancy that. I'll, I'll go. I'll go elsewhere. So it's probably a lot of it is down to the, the player's preference. And I was just think when you mentioned Bio, can you remember when we <laughs> paraded Bio at half time in a game? And they did yeah, and it was like a, it was like an Undertaker entrance where he just appeared with the lights all around him. Yeah, and I think I remember that now and the the lack of contribution that that guy's made. And you think back to that introduction of like a. <laughs> it's like the WWF introduction with the, uh, with the lights out and oh my god it's uh, that's a little bit embarrassing isn't it <laughs> but uh, no but uh, Declan was mentioned before we came on air that Leo Connor's going to be playing in uh, at Wembley for for yep. uh, in, a, in a cup final so you know that that's good experience for him uh, down there uh, albeit playing in front of an empty Wembley probably which is a shame for him um, but Ultimately, it's a high-pressure game, and you know, hopefully, he comes back with you know uh, an eye on getting into the first team because international player. Am I right? Isn't a Republic yep. international? Yep. Um, really good credentials at Man United. Um, similar threads to the Shaw thread yesterday about you know when he was leaving, all these folk going, "Why are we letting this guy go?" Um, so. You know, hopefully that's that, that stands him in good stead for coming back to us. Yeah, and I think there's there's only maybe a couple of players that are out on loan in Scotland. You've got um, Kerr McEnroy at Dunfermline. You've mm-hmm. got Leo Helge. I, I probably pronounced that terribly. Um, who's up at Ross County? Who looks like he's going to get a lot of game time now because I think is it um, the centre half at Ross County is now out for the rest of the season. Um, so we'll probably be seeing a lot more of him. Um, playing in the Scottish League it's the kind of level you, we hope that he'll rise to and he can come in and make himself available into the squad next year but yeah Declan we should be really trying to see if teams like Hamilton Ross County will take guys that are not getting into the team guys like Luke O'Connell surely mm. he should be out and loan in Scotland somewhere I think if you look at a guy like Chris Iyer who we were talking about earlier and the uh, JP mentioned him that, that figure of twenty five million. I think he can go for that. I think he's worth that. That was a player that came to us very young and raw, seventeen years of age from Norway, brought in, you know, at Spotty Bedoni Dyla, and we sent him out to Kilmarnock. Now that was a really good move for us because it went there and he was able to kind of convert into that that player that seemed to just become a lot more natural to the Scottish game and came back and look at what he's done. Again, Ryan Christie. We bought from Inverness back at Celtic, set him up to Aberdeen, get that bit of game time, brought him back in, and it, it worked out. So there's been stories in our team of players that have went on loan to other Scottish clubs and worked out. And obviously, maybe you'll look at Callum McGregor and say, well, he went down to Notts County, came back up and did a really good job. So there's there's arguments in both sides here, but I'd be more on your side, Colin, that it'd be better to get players out into the SPFL and let them experience a wee bit more of Scottish football, especially guys that maybe don't know the league as much. Um, obviously, Callum McGregor, a Scottish based player, going down to Notts County is a wee bit more seamless transition. Whereas I have coming in from Norwegian football to get that chance at Kilmarnock, gave him that bit of experience that he maybe needed in the league. Yeah, definitely. And speaking of Ross County, it's who we face on Sunday. You guys won't be back on before the game. Looking for your predictions for the game. A half seven kickoff on Sunday. The last time I remember football being played at half seven on Sky on a Sunday night. It was Dream Team and Harchester Rovers were playing. But um, JP, I'll come to you first. Predictions I'll, for the I'll, game on Sunday? I, I do remember uh, there used to be five past six kickoffs on a Sunday night. Uh, this is, oh God, I mean, I'm really showing my age when I can tell you that I remember those games. <laughs> I remember the, the Boxing Day game when Decanio scored with the Golden Boots against Aberdeen at Pataudry. That was a five past six on a Sunday night. Um if anybody hasn't seen that goal, look it up on YouTube. One of the best. Outstanding. Yeah, oh, definitely. Absolutely ridiculous. I remember watching that in the, my local pub and going absolutely tonto when he scored it, um, mainly in front of Rangers fans. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I, uh, no, I think Sunday night game, I, don't, I have no idea. What, uh, presumably it's because of Sky, I don't know. Um, but it seems absolutely bizarre that we're playing on a Sunday night in Dingwall, you know, like... It just seems really stupid, but um, it is what it is. You know, um, 
Ross County, I've not really been keeping an eye on their results. I know obviously uh, Yogi's in charge there now. Um, got a lot of time for him. Bumped into him once in the, uh, on the way up to, I was going to Dundee. We were playing Dundee away and he was waiting on his bus, picking him up. He was playing for their United. And I met him just uh, at the bridge and uh, <laughs> so I was sitting talking to him and he was telling me about being at Celtic and everything. And then, uh, some uh, uh, dressing room tales about Pierre Van Hoydonk, which I'll, I'll not elaborate on, but um, it was uh, it's, it's, it's probably X rated really for for this time of the day. <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> um, bye. Um, I, I think I think if we can continue the way we've been playing, um, I'd like to think we could get the three points. Um, whether or not that will please people if we go up there and get a 1-0 and it's a David Turnbull goal <laughs> and we don't do anything for the rest of the game. I, to be honest, at this stage, I, I just want to see us win. Just like last mm-hmm. night, you know, I saw a few people tweeting last night when we scored our first goal, all right, let's get four or five here. I was just like, I, I, that would have been nice, but I just wanted to see us win because wins have been such a... a uh, a rarity <laughs> of of late. So yeah, a, any win on Sunday is, is good for me. The the, the more the more uh, we can get a bit of respectability back, the better. Declan, any win will do. Any win will do. Yeah, as I said at the start of the show, Colin, it's just a case of trying to get this season over and done with. And it's not meaning, you know, I think my three years will still be at the stage of if Celtic don't win the rest of your day's crap and you just don't want anything else to happen you know you just want a Celtic victory to kind of put you in a wee bit of a better mood so anyone will do if I was going to say I'll, I'll go for a 2-0 one I don't think we'll be as convincing as the 5 up there before but what I would say is I'm gutted that we're not going because half 7 at Ross County up and down well, would have been an absolute mess and there would have been some sights coming off the buses by the way you know, so I've I'm never, gutted I've never been to Dingwall ever and I, I, uh, well it's really? a good away day yeah, that's a great away day. Great away day. <laughs> I can imagine, I yeah. Never so, been. gutted we're not going up there because that would have been a few good sights to see. Probably a few uh, spare tickets going to boot up there with some casualties. But um, <laughs> hopefully we can go up there and get a win. Yeah, and we will be back on Sunday um, at 7 o'clock. Such a strange time to be out doing the game. We're, we're, we're waiting all week for all weekend for Celtic. Um, but 7 o'clock we'll be back on a Celtic State of Mind. Paul will be back tomorrow with the usual Friday squad, so tune in for that one at 12.30. We'll be back at 7 on Sunday for the pre-match and at 8 o'clock, um, a new show is launching on the channel, hosted by um, my usual Wednesday contributor, um, Amy Canavan. Uh, it's the Soccer Supernova with an interesting interview with former Celtic employee Jock Brown, so one to keep an eye out for. Um, but until tomorrow, Everyone, please stay safe and take care. And as always, hail, hail.